I'm okay. The family are okay. And um, yeah, it's, I'm all right. How about yourself? Yeah, all good. Thank you. Uh, I'm really excited for what we're going to have today because uh, we haven't spoke that much, but uh, literally when you just said to me the other day, it was really inspiring for what I was That's hearing right. about you. So I wanted to share that and you inspire me as well to do this, share your mindset. So today you're going to be the first one who is going to be in this uh, series. So I'm really excited for it. I'm really happy because I think that it's our duty as well as a human beings to share our mindset, but as well to the challenges and the strategies that we apply in order to, to develop ourselves because you are a really inspiration for me in the future because, man, for everything that you've been telling me in such a short time, it was, they say, wow, I need to put that on, on Facebook. I need to that. I need to share that with other people. So tell us about your story. Who is Danny? Who is Danny? So, <laughs> it's a, well, it's, it's, I'm not really, it's, it's not really that interesting, if I'm honest. So I grew up abroad. My father was in the shipping business and myself, my brothers and sisters, we, uh, we were born in the Middle East and we were like expatriate family. So we, our culture was shared with quite a lot of uh, um, Americans, European, basically people from around the world. And then as I got older, I wanted to kind of experience what it was like to live in England, really, um, because we never had. Um, we, my dad's from Southmead, my mum's from Downend, so we were, we're a Bristol family, but we never spent any longer than two months of the, of the year back in England. Um, so as I got older, I kind of went slightly wayward and started to get myself into a lot of trouble. Um, and my dad kind of saw the route I was going and basically gave me the option. It was a case of you move back to England and you live with your auntie which who I who I never knew really um living abroad or it was a case of joining the forces so that was my two options and I can remember I spoke to my dad on I think it was a Monday back in 1997 96 I spoke to my dad on a Monday I was on a plane on a Wednesday and then I basically turned up for my basic training um at HMS Raleigh, which is the Naval Training um, Institute. And that was a couple of weeks because I had to sign paperwork and everything. And, and that was it then. I was back in England, but on a ship, basically. Mm -hmm. And then... Wow. Yeah, and then... So I did four years Royal Navy, six years Royal Marines, and I was attached to 4-2 Commando. And then when I left the forces, I, I didn't know what to do with myself because... I'd gone from being really wayward to being really strict and disciplined and finding myself as an individual, really. Um, so when I left, when I left the forces, I was kind of like, I don't know what to do. Where do I go? Where will I find the same sort of camaraderie and all that kind of stuff? And then from there, I joined the police. Um, and I did eight years with the police. Um, wow. And that, yeah, started basically started off as like a, a PCSO. And then moved into things like counterterrorism, reservism, um, intelligence, and all that kind of stuff. And it was a really wide spectrum, and it was it was great. But there was still that lacking. Um, the police has changed considerably. So as I got longer in service, I could see these changes, and it, it just wasn't doing it for me anymore. So when I left the police, I got into close protection work, and basically, kind of like like the well, bodyguarding or whichever we want to do, but I was working overseas. So I would go away, I would come back, I would go away, I would come back and it was great. But then as I got older again and I had my family, um, I was starting to miss things. So I would miss birthdays and Christmases. And I mean, I'm, I'm 39, 40 this year. And I just kind of wanted a, wanted to be a home man. And and that's what I did. So I left the close protection work and just focused on myself and my family. Um, and, and that's me in a nutshell, really. So, Wow. That's many things I want to ask you in regards to your, your story. One of the things <laughs> like, uh, what is the best experience that, that you ever had being a soldier, for example? 
there's there's a million good <laughs> stories um and there's and there's a million bad as well so the good side of it is is that you you learn how to be an individual in the sense that you learn to look after yourself and you learn how to you, you're taught they break you and they remold you in this image of what they want um and it was when i was got to the stage of being broken as it were that i truly found myself and to me personally that was my best experience because it was like bang it was a moment of realization that i know when i was younger i was being a sod and then when you break you kind of realize these faults and these failings and you think i don't want to be that way because that's not how a human being or how i want to be perceived i want a sense of purpose and then when i was broken i had this light bulb moment and I realized that I don't want my life to go in this direction. I want it to go in that direction. I, I feel I want to serve, whether it's serve my crown, my monarchy, my flag, my country, serve myself. And like I said, to me personally, that was my best experience. I mean, there's, there's moments when I go, oh, I remember this time when we went and did this. But again, that's, that's fun. But to me, it was the self-realization. It was this moment, this epiphany. And from there, it just it teaches you this kind of, this drive forward approach to things. So this is the problem. This is the solution. How you get there is the journey. Well, and it was the okay. journey that I was, that I was always interested in. So no, it doesn't matter. Some, there's never an impossible problem and there's never an impossible solution. The journey is what, makes or breaks you and how you interpret that journey so like i said my best experience was as weird as it sounds was the breaking because i was so standoffish as a kid and this, you know i was i was kind of like stick my fingers up to the society now i don't want to do that who are you to tell me what to do but then when you you've got someone in front of you who you want to be telling you this is not the way like I said, it's like a light bulb and you, everything changes. Wow, man, that, that's fantastic. Because not many people realize that sometimes the journey sometimes is what is going to help you to to overcome certain challenge, you know? Um, literally, what you say is fantastic, but I don't know if you want to say something about that. Well, yeah, I mean, because it's not the problem that defines the individual and it's not the solution. It's how you cope in between. Is how you cope in between, because the problem, what may seem an impossible problem to someone, another person will look at that and say, "Well, that's easy." Everybody is built differently, psychologically, physically, mentally. So, how you analyze a problem, and how you get your end result, the the space in between is what defines us. You know, I mean. You could look at any problem. So you could look at knife crime, as, for example, as a problem or someone being bullied as the problem. And the solution is, I don't want to be bullied anymore. I don't want this to happen to me anymore. Whatever path you take as your journey in between defines you. So you could say, I'm going to take a knife to school and deal with this problem. That, that's a, that is what is going to define you for future. You could then turn around and say, I'm going to take it to the police. I'm going to speak to a parent. I'm going to do this. I'm going to do that. Your journey is who is what defines you. And whether it be right or wrong, it's a path that you have to take. That's the decision-making process. And the thing the force has taught me and my father, especially was that the choice you make is your choice. You cannot blame anyone else in the world for that choice because that is something that you have made wow. and when you get to whatever the resolution is whether you do take that knife to school or you do punch that person in the face or whatever you will then be held accountable for that because it's not you hear these stories of people making snap decisions but in reality it's not a snap decision because subconsciously somewhere in your mind something has bothered you and to you, that is the resolution. But everyone's perception of you will then instantly change. Absolutely. So how you, 
what decisions you make, that journey in between is what is key. Wow, that, that's literally a gem. <laughs> it's really good what you said. Um, hopefully people can hear about that because that's where I've been as well applying. Taking responsibility, you know, but taking responsibility with awareness, uh, with maturity, with flexibility as well. So I totally agree with you. Um, now that you're talking about the forces and that you're talking about you being a bit more disciplined, I will say as well, because you have you need to have a lot of discipline, right, when you are in the forces. How does that work, for example, inside? Because I haven't been in a force, so how does that yeah. work? Yeah, when, when I got when I got to my training establishment, I was not disciplined at all because all right. being, being an expatriate kid, um, mm -hmm. coming from England, living in another country, uh, I was kind of used to having things my way. And okay. I mean, my parent, my parents did everything, you know, they, they sacrificed, they worked and I never wanted or needed for anything. And in that sense, I became selfish because if I didn't get what I wanted, I'd stamp my feet and have a temper tantrum. And even up until my teens, I was the same. And then when I got to my establishment, I just kind of, my world completely changed because it wasn't about me. It was about the team. It was about everyone because everyone was going through the same thing. There were people who were away from home for the first time who had no family. You know, they, this was a last ditch attempt to try and find some sense of belonging for a lot of them. And then you kind of, you have to understand that you must sacrifice yourself you must sacrifice your your privileges to benefit everyone, not just you. And then once you realize that, the discipline kicks in then because you then realize that if again it's cause and effect and it's the journey. If I do this, I if I don't get my uniform ready, I know that everyone else will have to pay for my actions. And I don't want to and I don't want to be seen as someone who will let the team down. So you have to make good choices. That's not to say that if you make a mistake that's that's it game over because you you learn from mistakes and that's the thing there is nothing wrong with failure because failure teaches you and it was this, you know with discipline it's the same because if you're told right walk in a straight line towards that wall and you flinch when they tell you and they don't you know and because you think they're not going to tell you to stop you then realize right they they've got my interest at heart they're not going to let me walk into that wall they're not going to let me hurt myself. And then you then trust the process. You then trust discipline and discipline then guides you in a positive way because it teaches you how to be not just a team player, but how to actually be a decent human being because civility and discipline is it's, it's like being a child, you know, with your parents teaching you right from wrong. Discipline is the same because the thing is you can act a certain way in society and a lot of, especially nowadays a lot of people kind of just don't bat an eyelid but whereas i i have old sense old-fashioned senses and values which comes from discipline and it teaches you restraint it teaches you dignity humility it's, it's discipline is a really complex um tool because yes it's, it, you start with the basics with yes and no and yes you can have that no you can't have that and do as you're told but as you go on in life it becomes more complex and you have to use discipline differently and then I find I use it with my children and it's discipline I think probably if anything saved saved my life because if I was if I stayed undisciplined my life would have gone in a completely different direction massively Okay. It, 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 taught me, it taught me how to be, how to show restraint, how to show empathy whilst maintaining my sense of self. Wow. So do you think that you develop uh, your discipline when you've been in the forces? I think it was the starting block for me. Um, the forces, obviously, it teaches you discipline in the sense of, the, of a military application. Mm -hmm. But then when you go away, or when you leave or when you go off and do your own thing you still have that that foundation of discipline and then it teaches you the more you use it and the more you show discipline you then 
have your own teaching techniques to discipline yourself. And that can go from anything from your work ethic to your training ethic, you know, and it's, it's, it's a major tool. And I think it's something that a lot of people don't realize how important it is, especially when it comes to things like um, physical training, whether it be weightlifting or aesthetics or, because to be a bodybuilder, you have to discipline yourself to, right, I know I can't eat after four o'clock or I can't eat this after such, such a time. I need to cut this out. And you have to almost punish yourself, but it's showing restraint because your end goal is to win or is to look a certain way. If you don't have discipline, then you, will, you won't achieve it. It's the same as a work ethic. If, you've, if your job is nine to five and you start finishing work earlier and earlier and earlier and earlier because you have no discipline and you can't stick to the rules, you lose your job. So discipline pays a major part in everything we do regardless and you can apply it to the most simplest of things you know i know i must drink two two and a half liters of water today you know to i can only eat so many meals i can only eat you know i must uh, fast i must do this that and the other you can apply it to the smallest thing right to the biggest thing it's one of those things that's universal well so um, regards to self-discipline now because it's so interesting what you're saying what we we what it will be a uh, one challenge that you got with self-discipline and what it will be something that you can give an strategy or an advice or a tip to someone. A, t a tip for someone to do with discipline. At the end of the day, the only person you ever compete with is yourself. Mm -hmm. If you want, if you want to achieve a goal, then don't cheat yourself. Because that's what all you're doing. If, if you want to be the strongest man in the world, you know for a fact that your training regime is going to look a certain way. And if you deviate from that and you don't show discipline and you don't stick to the program, you won't achieve it. You know, so the, the best person to ever compete with is yourself. Wow. That's the best advice I ever heard regards to, to that. I think is 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 all goes to the point of you being accountable to yourself and telling the truth to yourself, right? Well, yeah, because wow. the thing is, you, 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 can't, you can't lie to, you can lie to other people and people will or won't believe you. But if you lie to yourself, you instantly know it's a lie. So you're, the only person you're deceiving is yourself. And if you constantly deceive yourself, you then set your mind back and if you set your mind back you lose focus you lose focus you lose direction wow. so you you can if you you know if you if a certain day of the week is a cheat day then stick to that don't have two cheat days because again you won't achieve the goal that you set for yourself if you, why set yourself a goal if all you're going to do is cheat yourself because again you'll achieve nothing apart from a feeling of failure a feeling of oh i'm doing all this work but nothing's happening you know if if you have a certain goal in life whether it be uh, your gym goal your work ethic anything then stick to it don't lie to yourself because you can lie to your boss and you can lie to your mates at the gym but the only person you can't lie to is yourself so it, it achieves nothing really Wow. And um, what will be, or what is the tactics or techniques that you use, or even not techniques, but ways to you to handle when sometimes you don't feel 100% to do something, but you know that you need to do it? That's, that's, really, that's really good. Um, I always think what my father would say. Okay. T t my, my dad. I mean, we lost my dad a few years ago. My dad was a massive guiding light in my life. Um, and if I would say to my dad, I don't know, I want to play rugby professionally, my dad would be like, good, okay, let's do it. And my dad would drop whatever he was doing to focus and help and support. He wouldn't do anything for me, but he would be the one in my corner. Wow. And if I set myself, and if I set myself a goal now, I always think, what would my dad say? You know, is it a good decision? Is it a good choice? And then I, if I know something is a little bit 
on the edge and I sit there and I really think about it and I say, what would my dad say? If I instantly get in that, my dad would say no, my dad wouldn't be supportive, my dad wouldn't do this, then I instantly know it's a bad idea. On the flip side of that coin, now that we've lost my dad, my, uh, my partner, she's, she's like my biggest fan and she's my biggest supporter. And that is key to have a support network around you. And if she thinks it's a bad idea, then I won't do it. Um, and to motivate myself to, if for example, I'm at the gym and I, you know, I want to improve my deadlift or I want to improve my squat, then I get mad at myself because I think, well, why am I questioning it? Because I know I can do it because it's just weight. And then you have those little talks with yourself or I, you know, if you can get yourself fired up, because the thing is, it's not down to other people to fire you up. If, if again, if you have this goal in mind and you want to achieve it, then that's down to you to put the effort in. If you get in and it's half-assed and it's, you know, there's no form or there's no technique or you, you you give yourself an injury, then, you know, you shouldn't be relying on others. That's down to you to put that effort in. Because the thing is, anyone, you know, anyone who's been to the gym can, dead, you know, can deadlift, I don't know, 60 kilos, 70 kilos with really bad form. You know, the, the body's like a circuit board. It finds a path of least resistance. Do you know what I mean? And if it means swinging your hips or swinging your back and everything like that, you're going to achieve it. It's going to be a cheat, but again, the only person you're cheating is yourself. You need to focus on the, focus on the plan, focus on the, on the goal. And if you're not feeling it, if, if, if you're too fatigued or you're too tired at the gym, that's your body's way of saying, no, not today. You know, if, if you're not feeling it and your body is telling you and you're injured, you know, you, you're worried about an injury sometimes, you have to listen to the body. The body is 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 the ultimate indicator, and wow. that's that's just that's just a personal thing. There are some people who say, oh, "I'm not feeling it today. I'll drink a pre-workout. I'll go and do this, and I'll get my mates to big me up." But then, and they achieve it. Then fair play to them. But to me personally, I listen to my body, and I listen to and I listen to my mind. If my mind is not in a good place, and I think I'm not feeling it today, there's been times I'll walk into a gym. I'll be there for ten minutes and say, "You know what?" not feeling it today and I'll go home but then I'll spend time with my family I will eat with my family me and my partner will have a discussion we'll talk we'll spend time together and then after that I feel a hundred times better and then that sets me up for the next day or if I'm having a really bad mental health day and my and my wife looks at me and she knows I'm having a bad mental health day she'll say go to the gym because she knows to me that's a therapy for me that's a place where I can put all the world's worries to one side and focus on me and I can have my time. And then again, if I'm having a bad mental health day and she's, you know, like I said, she's so supportive and she'll say, go to the gym. I'll get to the gym and I'll rock out and I'll max out everything I'm doing. And I feel 10 times better. And then when I go home, it's a really pleasant experience because then I, my wife's missed me. The kids are happy to see me this, that, and the other. And I just kind of think, what was I worried about? Oh, it was just a, it was just a work drama. It was nothing. Or wow. I was really low, but now I feel better. And that's because I have this support network. You know, she knows me better than anyone. And she can literally look at me. And within seconds, the first thing she'll normally say is go to the gym. If wow. That's amazing. Day, yeah. Yeah. You know, I mean, she's, she's fantastic. She's my rock. And she'll, like I said, she can look at me and within seconds, she'll just go, go to the gym. Wow. So how important is for you to have a strong network? Is part of your values, what you would say? Yeah, I would say it's probably one of my, my core values. And the thing is, is where you can, a support network should never be big. It's, it's you know, my, my dad always said, keep your circle small. Surround yourself with the people who you know 100% without fail you could turn to in a moment of crisis and they would be there in a flash. Wow. You know, and, and that's what I do. And as selfish as it sounds, I don't, I will talk to anybody about anything and that's a conversation. And that doesn't mean that they're part of my support network. That's, 
you know, that's just people shooting the breeze and having a conversation. But the real people who save me from myself, if you see what I mean, is I, I can count on one hand, you know, and that's my partner, my mum, my kids, and that's it. Because I know without fail, I could go to them in a, in a moment of crisis and they would drop everything. Wow. And, and a support network is key, but you need to surround yourself with the right people. My dad always used to say to me, show me your friends and I will show you your future. Wise. Yeah, I mean, he was, he was the wisest man I, I knew. And that's why I said, I always kind of think, what would my dad say? If you surround yourself with falseness and surround yourself with people who are mediocre to kind of feed an ego, then it's, it's a massive fall. Because when, when shit does hit the fan and things go wrong, nine times out of 10, a lot of those people are going to bail. They're going to go the other way because they'll look at you and go, that's a you problem. I don't know what you want me to do, but that's a you problem. Whereas if I'm having a problem, I can say to my partner, I'm having a problem. And it doesn't matter what she's doing she will drop everything absolutely everything and i don't even have to, don't even have to question it and it could be a case of juggling the kids and cooking dinner it doesn't matter she'll drop it or she'll phone her mum have the kids and me and daddy need a moment and we will talk until the sun comes up if need be but it doesn't matter what it is i could have done the worst thing in the world she will make help me make the right decision and she will be the one to guide me in the right direction whether it means being away from my family for x amount of time or sacrificing something if it's the right decision then it has to be done and she will be the one to say these are your options this is what we need to do this is the goal this is the journey let's do it wow that's amazing and talking about that uh, let's move on to your career um as a strong man yeah it was um <laughs> it was it was kind of short-lived but um yeah so i i kind of got into weight training to begin with when i was in the forces because you have to be physically fit and mm -hmm. to me i mean it was great you know going out running and doing all this kind of stuff but i knew in my heart of hearts it's not what i wanted to do um you know it was great being fit but the look, the aesthetic of it wasn't, it didn't fit me. And, you know, you are the only person who knows yourself better than anyone. If you want to look a certain way, you know what you want, you know what you want to achieve. And when I was sort of towards the end of my military career, I kind of got into weights and talking to people. And then the, the advantage of being in the military and traveling the world is that you get to, you meet everybody, you talk to everyone you know about anything and i found myself surrounded by people who were into who looked the way i wanted to look and i just kind of was like almost in in all of them so then when i had in my mind a picture of what i wanted to look like i kind of i so i joined sort of like the the military weightlifting team and then it started off with things, you know, almost like Olympic weightlifting kind of stuff, you know, the snatch and grab and all that kind of stuff. And again, it just, it just wasn't hitting the mark. I kind of got the size I wanted, but again, it wasn't the sport I liked. It was just, it was almost an introduction and sort of, I, we used to watch when I was a kid, we used to watch like the world's strongest man and all that kind of stuff, you know, and you, you kind of be in all of these mountains of men and you'd be like, I want to look like that. And in the end, when I started talking to people and going to gyms in different countries and things like that, literally, I would find the biggest guy in the gym and do what they did because it must work because it works for them. Because look at the size of them. So then I started competing at a very amateur level, um, you know, kind of in England. And then when I'd get like, um, when I was on board ship or we'd go to a certain country, I'd be like, oh, right, okay, there's a strongman competition or there's a, you know powerlifting competition and i just throw me hat in you know how much is the entry fee oh it's x amount and that's how i kind of got into it and then i kind of i, I got bitten by the bug and 
you know, when you start talking to people and they're like, yeah, I've got to eat this much and I've got to do this and I've trained six times a day or I trained twice a day for four hours at a time. And to me, it was kind of like, wow, this is what I want to do. And that's why I started doing. And then, you know, but it's one of those things that if you work a full-time job, it's really difficult to do. So it kind of took a back seat for a little while when I was in the police. And then when I left the police, I really got into it again. And, you know, I competed in Bristol, I competed in England, um, never placed very highly, but then again, it wasn't about winning. It was the fact that I was doing something that I loved. And I didn't, I didn't care if I came first or a hundred and first, the experience and the knowledge base that you build was to me was, was the, was, was the reward. And that was the thing you, you could talk to, you know, you'd meet, you'd meet people who you'd idolize like Eddie Hall or big laws and all this kind of stuff, uh, Brian Shaw. And you would just talk to them and they were like, what, who you thought were gods were just general people who sacrificed, you know, a lot to achieve their goal. And again, small support networks that they had. And that's what got me into it. It was just, it was almost kind of like the camaraderie. And again, it, to, for me, it was an intelligence gathering exercise. It was talking to people. It was getting tips and hints and training programs for free and, you know, all the kind of underhanded stuff, you know, or would you do this? And, you know, it, again, it was just, for me, it was building a knowledge base and having that knowledge base, I wanted to share and I, I you know, I like back in the day before the Facebook and Instagram and all this kind of stuff to get to the size a lot of these guys were, it was almost like a hidden secret and Facebook and Instagram and YouTube that opened the doors, opened the floodgates and you know, all these training programs that these guys had hidden away for so long became available. And, you know, now you've got 16 year olds who are built like mountains and and to me that's what it's about it's about sharing of knowledge so strongman you know again i i never cared if i came first tenth a millionth it was an intelligence gathering exercise because it was the only opportunity i'd get to achieve my own goal to be as big as physically as big as possible what what have you learned to uh, being a strongman Doing strongman was, it was kind of like a double-edged sword, really, because it was, it was pushing yourself physically, mentally, emotionally to such a level. And almost a lot of guys and a lot of women who compete, they thrive off of that. You know, it's the release of hormones, endorphins, and, you know, all this kind of stuff. The, the negative side of it is that a sport like strongman or bodybuilding or anything like that, it's incredibly selfish. And I don't mean that in a horrible way. It's because a lot of guys who do it professionally, they, they stop working, they throw their jobs, you know, they discard their jobs so they can focus on this goal, this dream. There's no money in it. Um, a lot of money comes from sponsorship and things like that. So you have to be, selfish in the sense that you have to focus on you 24 hours a day seven days a week 365 days a year wow and you know I, I i tip my hat to anyone who works hard at what they do i i you can't fault them because the the drive and the determination that they show is admirable and if it gets them to where they want to be then that's wonderful but again, you have to look at the negative of every positive. And the negative is, is that you, you constantly put yourself first. My, I mean, I'm old now. I mean, I'm, I'm 39. And, but my partner, she still buys all the shopping. Three quarters of the fridge is mine. Do you know what I mean? It's, yeah. you know, and whatever I need, she sacrifices for me. I don't compete anymore, you know, I mean, I've, I might give it a go this year just to, just for shits and giggles, really, but to maintain who I am 
physically, mentally and everything. I still have that selfish streak in me, you know, kind of like <clears throat> if I've got 50 pound in my pocket, I'll go and buy some, you know, I'll buy proteins, I'll be buy pre-workout, I'll buy this, I'll da, 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 da. Whereas in reality, I sit there and I think, shit, I could have spent that money on buying my partner some flowers and buying her some chocolates and a thank you card. But she never, she never bats an eyelid. She's always like, I've done the shop for the week. There's chicken, there's rice, there's pasta, there's this, there's this, there's this, there's this. And, you know, the list is endless. And I sit and I go, oh, thanks. And I take it for granted. But then when I sit back and really think about it, I'm like, what am I doing? You know, it, it takes two seconds. She never asks for anything because she always focuses on, if it's not me, then it's the kids. But a lot of the time it's a case of when she's cooking, she knows because, I, because I've been unwell for quite a while, she sits and goes, right, I know we can't have this and we can't have this and we can't have this. So I won't buy that. So that means the kids won't have fish fingers or they won't have this or they won't have the little snacks that they like. But instead I'll buy him corn mints and I'll buy fresh vegetables and I'll buy organic and I'll buy this and I'll buy this. And I'm always at the front of her thought. And when you do any kind of competitive sport, really, you don't think about the people in the background so much because you're, you're constantly thinking, right, it's two o'clock, I need to have a meal at two, then a meal at half past two, then a meal at three, and then I need to go and get my gym, and then I need to do this, and I need to do that. And you, you're constantly thinking of yourself. And sometimes you have to stop and think about the people who have made it possible for you to do what you do. And wow. I think you, you really need to, if you don't stop and you don't think about the people who have enabled you to achieve the goals or to do the things that you love, then you go from being selfish to being almost spiteful. Because if you can't say thank you to someone who has allowed you to do the things you do, then you don't deserve the support network because it's the selfish people who sit there and go, they take and they take and they take and they, and they give nothing back. And then when you have a problem, you've got no one to turn to then because you've burnt all your bridges. That's true. Wow. And regards to that, now um, I want to talk to you about mental health. So what, what will be the most challenging mental health that you overcome? Ooh. And how um, you did it? Let me think. So when I left the forces, I never felt like I was the same. Um, I'd been through some really awful experiences and the typical dominant man thing is to kind of like, nah, that's all right. You, you bury it away for such a long time, but you don't realize how corrosive that is. It, it kind of, it really does eat you inside. And I try to bury myself in things like the work in my work or you know, when I was, when I could feel myself having a moment where I was getting really angry and sometimes I'd get really mad and angry for no reason. I think, right, I'll go to the gym because I know I can hammer out a session. But when, when I realized I wasn't well, it was a really scary moment for me. And I can remember there was one time um, where I was I'd had a really bad day and I was low and I mean, I was beyond low. And, you know, I, I've been clinically diagnosed with PTSD, anxiety and borderline personality disorder. And that's because I never vented, I never talked. And I was so affected by the things I'd seen that I, I didn't want to admit it because I thought I was stronger than that. I'm not going to let those things bother me, but as a human being, it's natural for the things that ex-military, ex-police or currently serving soldiers and police officers and anyone who works in any emergency field or any frontline service, they will be affected. And you, you have to create some form of disconnect between what you've seen and how you live. But sometimes the lines blur and you can't disconnect from it or you either disconnect from it completely and you almost become a zombie because you're numb to it and I can remember there was a time where I disconnected from basically from reality really and I was 
walking up and down the suspension bridge because the suspension bridge held a really uh, Im important thing for me because it was my dad's favorite place. And I can remember having a bad day and I literally just stopped dead in the middle of the su suspension bridge. And I went, fuck it, I'll jump. And it got to a stage where I climbed the wall and I was standing there and I literally just closed my eyes and leant forward. And as I leant forward, someone grabbed me and pulled me back and never met them before, never knew who they were, but I hugged them like I was hugging a child because that was the moment I thought, I know I'm not well. I know there's something wrong and I can't, I can't hide it and I can't bury it anymore. And the, the thing with mental health is that it's one of those things that's really easily disguised and there's not enough people who ask the question, are you okay? And that, that's a massive thing because asking such a simple question is, is, is life changing to a lot of people because people who are suffering feel like no one cares. And even if a stranger just says, are you okay? Or if you know, if you know someone who is struggling, to ask them a question, are you okay? It opens up a dialogue and they don't feel alone because that someone has shown them care. I mean, my, my partner, she has saved my life literally a million times. There's, I have really good days. I have really bad days. Um, so when I'm having a bad day or if something is not right, she's, she's like, like in Spider-Man, she senses it, you know, and she can, she can pull me to one side. And when she talks to me personally, it feels almost euphoric in the sense that she, I, I know if I didn't have her to talk to, then my life would be very, very, very different. And she has literally been like my life, my lifesaver. And I think everybody needs to find that one person who they know they can talk to without judgment, because the problem with mental health is it has this massive stigma attached to it. And there's a lot of people who claim, you know, All right, mate, how you feeling? But it's not a genuine and sincere question. It's just a conversation starter for them. Okay. And a lot of people, a lot of people who suffer with mental health don't feel that they can talk to a lot of people because they know it's not a genuine concern. It's just like, all right, how's it going? Mm. And that, that what they're expecting to hear is, yeah, not too bad. But if you open the floodgates and you go, well, actually, do you know what? I nearly threw myself off the bridge last night. They kind of kind of go, oh, okay. And they kind of go off in another direction very, very quickly. But, you know, my, my coping strategies now are very different from what they used to be. Um, and I think everybody's coping strategy is different for that person. Everybody has a way of dealing with something, but the worst thing you can do is kind of bottle it up. Um, you know, mental health is kind of like a bottle of diet Pepsi, a bottle of diet coke and Mentos. Do you know what I mean? The Mentos is the problem. Throw it in, do the lid up, and you just watch it build and build and build, and eventually, it erupts and it pops. And that's the same as mental health. You get to a stage where enough is enough and it takes a massive moment to make you realize wow there is something wrong i need to do something about it whether it be finding a positive outlet talking to somebody or doing something but you know when i have a bad day i feel like i'm completely alone but in reality i know i'm not because i have my other half who would literally if it meant she'd have to stop the world from turning she would and that's like I said she's been my lifesaver and I think having that positive influence in my life has changed the direction in which it was going to the way it should be that's that's wonderful I think that's that's uh, for me it's inspired me so much uh, to to see like life is so wonderful and sometimes the best teacher is life um what we overcome what we go through what is going to happen later but i think that's that's amazing because uh, hearing from you that you've been 
overcoming such a wonderful experiences because in my case that's an experience even though you you may die you know jumping from the bridge but i think it's teaching you many things and now it is opening the opportunity as well to 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 inspire other people to see that is other options is other opportunities and as well other tools like for example having a strong network uh, trying to to be transparent and as well work with your values you know and and trying to understand the journey as you said and just trying to be open right yeah no i i agree i think like i said i mean it all stems from sort of like the, the journey from point a to point b this is the problem this is the resolution and the journey is what makes or breaks you um exactly. you know and that that day you know this was the problem is that i hated myself and the world to me was not what i thought it should be you know i i still believed in that everybody should talk to each other with decency and this and that and coming from a military background and a police background etc cetera, etc cetera, you know you kind of think the world shouldn't be such a bad place but in reality, there are horrific things that happen in this world. And sometimes those things are out of your control because it, it could be nothing to do with you. You could be walking down the street and see someone, I don't know, have a row, have an argument, get attacked and such and such. And, you know, the, the, your human nature is to intervene. But then when you see so much bad going on in the world, you just kind of think, why? Why is everyone like that and it's the same as like things like in your workplace you know you get sort of like workplace bullying and it's like being back at school for a lot of people or you know when your boss breathes down your neck and this that, and the other and i heard this really interesting thing that empathy seems to have evaded this generation you know because you can go into work and you can sit at your desk or you can do what you do and your boss your manager your supervisor will come up to you and say this hasn't been done. This hasn't been done. If it's not done by the end of the week, I'm going to put you, I'm going to report you and put you in for a reprimand, but you're not going to get anything positive from that. That person is then going to feel, well, why it, it doesn't motivate them. Empathy is this massive thing that seems to be lacking, but yet it's the simplest of things. The other way to look at it is that your boss could come in and say, this hasn't been done. This hasn't been done. This hasn't been done. Is everything okay? Are you having problems at home? Is there something going on that you need to discuss with me that we can talk privately about to try and help you and move you forward? And it's just, you know, three words, you know, are you okay? And it's, it's amazing the difference it makes, you know? And I think when you're on your journey, you, you have to, meet and surround yourself with people who you know will do right by you i and it's like you see me in the gym and I, I i always talk to everybody and one of the first things i say to everyone goes you okay and it's not me trying to make conversation that's just a genuine thing because sometimes you'll see, see people when they're their head in their hands or they're you know they're sweating and they, they you know they're like oh i can't get this laugh i can't get this last lift oh do you know what I've just done a session and I'm absolutely beaten. But, you know, ask the question, are you okay? And sometimes, you know, people will look at you and go, I can't get this last lift. And you go, okay, then. And sometimes this is just about changing the way you think. And, you know, if I'm struggling with a lift, for example, I don't look at it as way. I look at it as bags of sugar. I can rationalize it into something that I can quantify. So 20 kilo plate. Yeah, but to me, that's 20 bags of sugar. That's nothing. It's a bag of sugar. You know, and just asking the question, you can change someone's perception completely. And wow. then when you, if you can change someone's perception of a negative outcome, then the only way is up. You know, That's my, well, yeah, I mean, my, my dad always said never end on a failure. And that's the thing, because if you end on a failure, it's a psychological thing then, because if you end on a failure, the failure tells your brain, we're not going to do it. Let's not bother. Let's not try. We'll, call, we'll draw a line under it here. But, and I mean, the gym is a prime example of that, you know, because you can, if you're going for a lift or you're going for a curl or a bench or whatever, 
and you you get to the stage and you can't push it up anymore and you think right that's it I'm done that's it it's a failure but then what I do is I'll go okay move it an inch move it half an inch if you can move it further than when you started doesn't matter if it's a millimeter or a meter if you can move it that small distance that's not ending on a failure you've moved it from point a to point a in a bit then it's then it's a win because you've gone further than what you thought you could Sorry. and then that's a that's a massive psychological bonus then because then because it's a win you then tell your brain yeah next week i'm going to move it two inches the week after that i'm going to move it six inches i'm going to move it a foot i'm going to do you know instead of you know i'll that deadlift is two is 250 kilos fine i won't be able to lift it all the way up but if i can lift it just off the floor okay and then it gives you something to build on it gives you something to strive towards that's that's wonderful I, i'm literally i'm making mental notes about everything that you're saying <laughs> but it's so wonderful to 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 hear from you all these type of uh, mentalities because you I, that's my perception okay for what i've been uh, hearing from you and listening to you is like you you develop different type of mindsets and you put it together <laughs> it's like you got a mindset uh, that you develop through the forces one is like a strong mindset, one is like a tough mindset, and you put it together sometimes and you just listen to the different type of mindsets. And that's amazing, you know? <laughs> yeah, I mean, it's, it's, it's about adaptability because the thing is you have to adapt to the situation that's presented. And if you can take little bits of everything that works and mix and mash it to suit you, then, again, you, you keep moving forward. And the thing is... If there's an obstacle, and again, he's like, that's the problem. The solution is to get to over there. So I'm going to take something from here, something that my dad said, something that my wife said, something that I heard someone say at the gym. And you take all these little inspirations and you make it your own. You can, you can move, you can progress. And to, progression is key. And the thing is, you should never, you should never jump into anything kind of thinking, You'll, you'll get the result you want straight away. And because at all goals and all achievements take time. Um, and I mean, I, I used to play rugby when I was younger at quite a high level. And, you know, when I was a kid, I was a bit, you know, I'm not exactly slim, but I was a roly poly kind of, ki kind of kid, you know, and I liked drinking me cans of pop and eating crap and all that kind of stuff. And I can remember when I said to my dad, I want to play high level rugby. And he said, okay. He said, remember though, you can't build a skyscraper on wooden foundations. And then I never really got that. And I kind of was like, what? You need to have a foundation. You need to have something in your core to help you build on yourself. If you have a weak foundation and you jump into a situation, it's going to fall. You're going to tumble. Build something in your core, in your heart, in your soul. Give yourself that foundation that you know that you can build on and build successfully. And that's the key. Have something inside of you that tells you, this is the way I want to go. If you're weak, not, not if you're weak-willed, but if, you, if your attentions are not just and you jump into something 150%, without prep, without working on it, you're going to fail. But then again, that failure teaches you a lesson. It teaches you, maybe I should give it more time. Maybe I should start smaller. You cannot build a skyscraper on wooden foundations. Work from the well, inside out. That, that's amazing. I, I really like as well that quote. And it's literally many things that I wanted to ask you. But uh, just to wrap up this this amazing talk this amazing launching of this share your mindset and i'm really happy to as i tell you i i got the the honor to have you because it's not just one mindset that dan got it's like you got many mindsets because you've been coming you've been going through to so many phases in your life and that is so interesting to hear from different phases you know and it's amazing it's amazing and that's what it makes you you're not such a unique person um, that's, that's, that's really kind of you. I mean, I'm I'm really honoured to be the first one to do this. I mean, it's and yeah, I suppose you're right. There, I have 
I suppose I don't know whether that's my kind of like my split personality, but I, I have a mindset to suit the mood, if you see what I mean. If I'm kind of, you know, you, you, you kind of, through life's experiences, you'll go through really good things and you'll go through really bad things. And if you don't want the bad things to happen again, you use that experience and that mindset because this happened to me once before. This is how it made me feel. I don't want to feel like that again. So I'm going to, you know, I'm going to have a cautious attitude. But then when you want to achieve, I kind of think, right, I need to drive forward. I need to do this. This is what I need to achieve my goal. And you have to be, you know, you have to kind of pick and choose and use your life experiences. It doesn't matter if you're 10 years old or you're 60 years old. Everyone has had some form of experience that they've learned from or they've had a positive outcome, even a negative outcome. You use that to to your benefit to achieve something else, you know, and the one of the key things is, like I said, I mean, my dad was this massive you know, massive figure in my life. And, you know, he'd, he'd been through a lot and his knowledge and his attitude rubbed off on me massively. And it's him that I owe, you know, this kind of adaptability because my dad always said, listen to a thousand people and take, if you, and take one thing away from everyone you speak to. And if you can take at least one thing away it helps you build character. It, you know, if you listen to someone's sad story and you see ups, how upset, how emotional they get, you know that they're hurting because of that experience and you don't want to hurt like they do, but you want to help them. Listen to everyone, you know, and that, that's my biggest tip is, you know, talk to as many people as you can, make friends with anybody and listen because listening is key. Because if you can listen to someone else, then you can listen to yourself. Wow, that's that's literally something that I've been just visualize, uh, doing a visualization, you know, and I, I, that's what I want to do with share your mindset, trying to uh, see how is the, the beauty of being you, being me, for example, and trying to share that with other people, you know, because many people at the moment, they think about that, uh, certain things are impossible or certain things um, have to be that way because they have to be that way but you are the totally opposite you know you are you are turning around something that it may be a difficulty for you maybe or it may be like for example all the challenges and situations that you've been going through you just not may take responsibility for it but you are taking responsibility for it and you build such a strong and beautiful network and it means so much for you um your passion and dedication as well to to understand how valuable they are to you is is incredible, you know, and trying to be aware, we will say as well, right? It's that consciousness that you got now, uh, being aware that your family is really important, how valuable your partner is, it, your kids, you know, the gym, all these as well. And I think in my case, it's going to be down to being aware of what you got around. Um, trying to, to live life as, you know, listening to people and trying to take something from them. That's something that I like it. And the question, the question that I got finished, it was like, what would be the best advice that you would give to your youngest self? Oof, the best advice I could ever give to my younger self. Life is not easy. If life was easy, there would be no war there would be no famine and everybody would get along. However, there is light and there is hope and trust, trust yourself to do great things. Cause people don't, people think that they don't have the ability to do great things. And a great thing doesn't mean curing cancer. A great thing could be, talking to someone or being someone's shoulder to cry on someone's trust that is that's my best advice i'd ever give myself is that there is light at the end of the tunnel it may not feel like it but it is there you just have to keep moving forward wow that's the best advice that you're here so far and i like it <laughs> 
thank you for sharing that. And thank you as well for your openness. Uh, sometimes nowadays, uh, when we are living at the moment, you know, in this so fast paced world, we are not open, you know, um, sometimes being so open, being on Facebook Live, you know, we got people who are watching us and be so open of what you mean coming through, who you are, um, what means to you being yourself, being being who you are, and being so open. I think it's, that's that's fantastic. That means that you are in peace with yourself, you know, that you are comfortable with who you are, and that you wanted to to be able to as well to to promote where it's going to be hope, as you said, where it's going to be that is life at the end of the tunnel, that you can make it, that you need to believe in yourself. And I think that's valuable for me, first of all, and I think as well for all these people, you know, because sometimes uh, we go as well so much information outside that we think that we cannot make it. Um, I think everyone can make it as long as you said, you know, all these, all these type of things. If you want a strong network, if you go support, if I have to be valuable support, if you are making uh, the, the point A to B, right, and enjoying the journey, all this type of thing, I think is like such a valuable time that I, that I spent uh, today with you. And I want to say thank you first. I'm really grateful that you're taking that time uh, to share your experience. We almost an hour uh, uh, talking. Oh, wow. uh, and that's amazing. I can't have uh, such a long conversation in a long time. Um, it's really sad because it, it's, it's supposed to be like that, you know, like talk between human being to another human being and appreciate the other human. And that's what I want to do with Share Your Mindset. And I'm so happy that we're starting with such a really good start with you because, man, is literally you are like an example for me in the future because it's literally you overcome so many things. And I'm really happy that you're alive, man, because you might, <laughs> you, 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 are, you are making my life different. I'm seeing from a different perspective. That's why I think many people are going to see life in a different perception. You know, it's going to be totally different from the now. This means I'm hearing from you as well, everything that you've been saying. So thank you. Thank you very much for, for doing that. <laughs> um, no, it's, it's, it's been an absolute pleasure, mate. It's, um... Again, it, it kind of goes back to what I said. It's, we, we haven't really spoken and we've kind of, you know, said hello in the gym. But if you, again, it's just taking the time to talk to another person. And, you know, to, I mean, today's been one of those days for me where it starts off really good and then it went a bit of a nosedive. But then, you know, again, my wife kicks me up the ass and said, let's do this. Let's, you know, we can conquer the day because that's what it is. You just take everything at a day at a time. And, you know, because I was wary about doing this and I was like, how open do I be? But then listen to my, you know, listen to her say, tell, tell your story, you know, because the thing is something I may have said may upset some people or it may help someone and whichever, whatever someone takes away from this is amazing, whether it's positive or negative, it's, it's going to be, it's it's an experience that I've shared and I'm really happy that I've got the opportunity to do it because it's not something that anyone has done really apart from apart from my, my other half you know she's the one who's always said so tell me what's happened today tell me about this tell me about that so it's it's, it's a refresh it's refreshing for me and I really appreciate the opportunity to talk to people and if anyone has a question or if they you know you know they can talk to you and pass it to me or whichever because you know if any if i can help anyone so they don't feel as alone as i have felt in the past then i'm all for it yes i think you will start making a movement you know with with human <laughs> beings and, and trying to make it make it happen probably it may be that and uh, today we discover but yeah of course uh, this video is going to be there on Facebook, on the Facebook group, and I will make a short video probably uh, in the following days, just to make sure people that it's okay to be okay, and it's okay not to be okay, you know? And there's nothing wrong with being okay or not okay. It's part of our human being's emotions. But we need to understand that we are not alone, as you said. And like, it's people who've been there before you, and that they can help you out. And as you, for example, you will be out an amazing reference regards to how you can be better, how you can overcome certain challenges. Uh, of course, I want to do that with my pleasure. I will 
let people know about you. Um, it's going to be there, and I will come back for sure to to rewatch uh, this amazing uh, talk, you know. And just having the honor to to have you here is is awesome. So thank you again, and thank you, thank you very much. Um, I know we will see each other in the gym, but it's going to be amazing. Uh, it will be a pleasure always to see you. But thank you again for for being here. Uh, bless you, and thank you. Thank you, thank you.